So, uh, next talk is me. <laughs> uh, this talk is about uh, cognitive attraction, what Dan and, and Nicola have described under that name, that some, others model, some other models also called uh, content biases, although Dan and Nicola would argue that this is a misnomer in some ways. And it's about one specific case of cognitive attraction that has to do with portraits and the way they evolved uh, in the Renaissance, specifically the way they turned their eyes <coughs> upon us. So, the, the broader issue I was trying to address while doing this study is the relation between two interesting cultural phenomena that you could characterize as the big friend and the beginning of culture. Uh, you might say that culture has one enemy and one friend. The enemy is demographic turnover, the passing of generations. The phenomenon by which uh, every generation, people who know a given tradition are replaced with people who do not know it and have uh, to learn it all over again is all the uh, risks of loss and distortion that this new transmission implies. This <coughs> wear and tear mechanism of uh, generational turnover. But this is arguably a, a enemy of culture, and this is why we need a logical transmission or a horizontal transmission, anyway, mechanism for preserving culture against uh, the permanent demographic change that um, all species undergoes. The second mechanism is the mechanism of cognitive attraction that we have uh, been studying a lot. Uh, there are many ways of uh, describing it. In this, talk, in this talk, I will insist on uh, the, the most general and some would say universal types of cognitive attraction. So the idea here is that some traditions are more likely to be transmitted and memorized because they appeal to some very widespread and basic psychological mechanisms. And there are some very intriguing examples would be uh, ice creams that appeal to a fairly widespread taste for sugar and I'm afraid fat, as well as teddy bears that tap into some cuteness uh, recognition mechanism that's again extremely widespread. And there's actually evidence that teddy bears evolved to be that way from the, the first teddy bears were quite uh, spooky and now they're, they're all cute. Right, so that's the, the, the interaction I, I'm interested in. I think that this enemy and this friend are not so inimical to one another as we could expect. Okay, so my hypothesis is that demographic turnover is the main form of creative destruction in culture. Uh, and it may have something to do with the evolution of cognitively attractive culture. I think that things like teddy bears and ice creams uh, are not just here because uh, they fit the format of our brain. They're not just here because they are a uh, human condition with large. There, there was a historical uh, story. There is, there is a historical story to tell to understand how uh, culture evolved to be that way. And I think this history involves demographic turnover crucially. So today's example is direct gaze. Uh, the psychology of gaze has made huge advances in recent years uh, with studies, both comparative studies involving dogs and wolves. Uh, developmental studies looking at newborns, uh, studies with adults, and we know a lot uh, more than we used to know about the effects of direct gaze on the human brain. And one study that I, that I particularly like was uh, made by Teresa Farroni, Gary Chiba, and collaborators. And what they show is that direct gaze faces, as opposed to uh, just vertical gaze faces, are preferentially looked at by newborns. And these are newborns as early as three days old. No, not three years, not three months, three days. So the word innate is then in bad a lot. But here I think there's, there's a case to be made for innateness here. Yeah. Three days, they're just out of the womb. And they prefer to look at their gaze faces. Interestingly, this preference mimics many effects of their gaze that we can also find in adults. For instance, uh, babies will be, uh, will be helped by their gaze when they have to categorize faces, when they have to ascribe them to a given gender or to a given identity, just as happens in adults, suggesting that we are dealing with two mechanisms that are quite closely uh, matched. Also, we know that adults find dairy gay spaces more attractive, uh, more interesting, more beautiful. The adjectives depend on the studies, uh, even when the expression is neutral. This is just one study, but this has been replicated several times. So we are on fairly safe ground when we say that there is this going to be attractive. Now, what about portraits? Of course, in many, many uh, portrait traditions, there is is not uh, the majority, it's not even uh, present at all. Because there is uh, 
scrupulously standardized in many, many traditions. So, for instance, in Japan or, or in India, uh, you have hardly, you hardly have, you hardly ever get any direct case. Uh, in Japan, it's probably explained by the fact that it's a no no, socially speaking, to, um, to gaze at people in many circumstances. There's a strong taboo against direct case, and of course, drawings and paintings uh, reproduce this taboo. And in India, it's probably explained by the popularity of the profile uh, way of drawing faces, which is very graphic, very striking, very easy way of drawing the face, but of course, does not lead you to, to paint the direct case. Uh, in the final portraits, on the other hand, you get 100% direct case. So they're, always, they're always looking at you. Of course, since I'm interested in variation and evolution, I chose two portrait traditions where uh, you, you get both types. So traditions where uh, the, the, the genre allows you to paint those direct gaze and about to gaze uh, paintings. And my prediction was that the direct eye gaze style should prevail in the long run when gaze direction is not strictly quantified. Typically, in those uh, genres, you start with a situation where direct gaze is non existent for uh, both those reasons, because people prefer profile and because it does not, it's not accepted to get at people. But whenever direct gaze appears, it invades and it becomes dominant as time goes on. Right. Uh, to for such a study, of course, we need big databases that are as that present as few biases as possible, and it's not always easy. I I use the internet to to find that kind of data or data, and I went online and took all portraits from the 16th century that were dated with at least 10 years precision in two online databases, one French, one Hungarian, and for Korean art, it was much harder because those portraits are hard to come by. I looked at all portraits from a much wider period, basically the whole uh, second millennium, that were dated with at least 100 years precision in 95 online databases. And I defined portraits in, in, a, in a very specific way, and I did not depart from that definition. So there were single original paintings where the painter tried to depict one other human individual's real appearance. In other words, uh, no diptychs, no ensembles, no triptychs, no copies, no drawings, no engravings, no self-portrait, no legendary character like Jesus Christ or Mary Magdalene, who might have existed but were certainly not depicted as they looked to the painter. And all portraits were double-coded for gaze direction. The lowest agreement I got was for the Korean portraits, 0.6 kappa, but for European portraits, the agreement was much higher at uh, 0.85. And I gathered various pieces of information about those portraits. And I think the interest of looking at online databases rather than the usual hits of art history is that we escape many biases. In particular, my hypothesis predicts that famous paintings should be uh, direct, should be more likely to gaze at you than non-famous paintings. Uh, because they're attractive, because we prefer them that way. And indeed that's the case. So if you look at uh, art books, you know, art portrait books that gather the most famous portraits, like Bastazac as Castiglione or the Mona Lisa, uh, those portraits are more likely to uh, contain uh, portraits that <coughs> gaze at, at the viewer. When you keep decade, gender, national school, etc. constant, famous portraits are more likely to look at the viewer. So gaze-wise, my broader sample of portraits is different from the more restricted sample that can be found in the commercial collections of famous portraits. Now, what do we find? Uh, we find a nice increase in proportion of direct gaze portraits in Korea, although the data are slightly, um, are slightly sketchy because we have only 74 Korean paintings in this graph. And this is actually, this is only one painting accounting for 25% of the paintings in the 15th century. But from uh, the period 1300 to uh, the 20th century, we see a very nice increase in proportion of direct gaze that starts from the moment there is it's introduced in the 17th century, probably from China, and leads us to uh, Dargais becoming the majority in the 20th century. And then the general dies, more or less. In the case of the European Renaissance, uh, what we get is a very nice, again, uh, increase that's much more robust statistically because we're dealing with more than, more than 600 paintings, uh, and that starts roughly in the middle of, of the 16th century. If we try to zoom out and look at this shift in context, we find that this shift is not an isolated phenomenon, a leap or a cycle. 
it's part of a much broader shift that was not reversed later, that starts in the 15th century. Basically, before, before that, you have very few, very, very few portraits, and none of them looks at you. And then somebody introduces the technique uh, in uh, roughly 1430, 1440, depending on how you count. And then it becomes very popular, and it, stay that, and it stays the, that way, it stays dominant, uh, basically until all times. And of course, you will have uh, an identity card, a passport, photograph of a loved one, a new wallet, that just proves that point. Uh, now, if we try to control for various variables, like the sex of the sitter, the national school of the painter, French, Italian, Spanish, etc., or the celebrity of the sitter, which is actually a very important uh, variable, we find that uh, the, the effect of the painting's date on the, on the proportion of direct gaze uh, stays quite strong and, and quite significant. With each passing decade, a portrait is 20% more likely to be a direct gaze. So yeah, it's this Renaissance gaze shift is part of a 300 years upward trend that was not reversed later, and it applies to most subpopulations in the sample. Uh, I very often I get the question, oh, but this is, isn't this some kind of cultural peculiarity that has to do with the European zeitgeist, that has to do with the rise of individualism, with the bourgeois culture, with Protestantism, and what have you? These are all very valid points, and was discussing, but before you make them think that this shift applies to Catholics and to Protestants, both within countries and between countries. It applies to men and to women. It applies to, obs it applies to obscure people and to famous sitters. It applies to mannerist painters and to anti mannerist painters. It applies to countries that were in growth, like the Netherlands. It applies to countries that were in recession, like Italy. It applies to rebellious countries like France or the other uh, countries that were in the midst of civil wars. It also applies to conformist countries that were uh, just throwing the, the Catholic line like Italy or Spain. No, no, not Spain, like Italy. Spain, it's always, always the other case for reasons that I can explain. Anyway, so that, that's the, the shift that we observe. So it was my first point. Direct ideas is a cognitive chapter. And now I would like to delve more into the mechanisms. What happened? Why this shift? What kind of change was the Renaissance shift? And we basically distinguish three options. The first option is that uh, we are dealing with a change in sitters that's totally independent of painters. Just imagine that people, for some reason, body language changed. changed. The people started behaving differently, started looking differently, maybe it was more accepted to look at people. And so they started behaving differently uh, when they sit in front of the painter, when they sat in front of the painter, but it could have been uh, the same as the foot boots. So people would enter foot boots with the, with the camera. Right? So if, if that's the case, then the, the shift should not be depend on painters at all. It could also be a change in painters. During their career, painters would change through trial and error, through imitation, and would start producing more Darwin's paintings because, for instance, they might have more of that Darwin's paintings are more successful, which they have reasons to think that they are. Or they may just be following the trend, they see that others do it, and by dynamic of conformist imitation, they would just increase the rate of uh, painting Darwin's portraits. Alternatively, we may be dealing with a change of painters, not change in painters. So the arrival of new generations of painters would be driving the change. And for reasons that I explained when I started, this is the hypothesis. Uh, privilege, the apprentice hypothesis. How do we test it? Um, the test is quite simple and it starts from a very simple uh, fact, demographic fact, which is that uh, a person's date of birth is equal to uh, their age minus the data, uh, their, the data which you observe then minus their age at that point. So <coughs> we know that if we uh, take a painter's date of birth and control for his age, we get a, a, a neat effect of generation. Late generation painters, regardless of their age, are more likely to paint direct gaze portraits. That's the apprentice hypothesis. Why? Because the effect entirely depends on the, on the painter's date of birth. So if we uh, look at a, at a different cohort, the cohort that arrived later, we will see more direct gaze paintings. We also predict, and that's a stronger prediction, that painters will not change their style during their career. In a given generation, painters of a greater age are not more likely to paint direct gaze portraits. In other words, they do not learn. It's a critical period thing. They have a period of learning and then it's done for, for the rest of their life. 
they could change many, many other things, but not that. Uh, we also predict that at a given date, H painters belong to earlier generation, of course, and H does not change their styles by virtue of the hypothesis, so they are less likely to paint dark gaze portraits. If you take a synchronic view of the population and you take the older painters, they should reflect the state of the art uh, when they were uh, 20, 30, when they learned how to paint. And lastly, painters of a given age living at a later date belong to later generations, so they are more likely to paint dark gaze portraits. Uh, so uh, the, the way to test this is simply to do two logistic regression, one pitting generation against age, and the other pitting age against date. In both cases, we are giving the model exactly the same information, so the models have exactly the same fit. And actually, this, uh, sorry, this comparison and this one are exactly the same, they have the same value. Because this is exactly the same, same kind of information. So we are dealing with three tests, and we are making three predictions. And other hypotheses, the ones that I detailed here, make completely different prediction in each of the three cases that I don't detail. Right, so what do we get? Uh, these are 561 portraits. I only look at European portraits because I can't do that analysis with the meager information I, I had on Korean portraits, most of which are anonymous. Uh, so we have 600, 560 European paintings from the Renaissance, and what we see is that there is a, a strong and significant effect of a painter's generation on the probability of the painting being Darugay's portrait, and no effect at all on the painter's age. So generations matter, but experience that does not seem to. If we look now at age pitted against the painter's age pitted against the date of painting, but it's always in decades, uh, we can see that uh, that age matters when taken when pitted against date, and date matters a lot also when pitted against age, exactly in the way predicted by the hypothesis. First, we know that we are dealing with a painter-driven effect, not a photograph effect, because age matters a lot. So with every uh, additional decade a painter observed on a given year is uh, less likely to paint our gaze portraits because he was born earlier. You wouldn't get that with the photo. Imagine photos that would give you a different type of eye gaze or a different pose depending on the age of the photos. That would be that would be weird indeed. And we know that it's generations, not experience, that matter because uh, with every additional uh, decade added to the date of the painting, we get uh, an upward effect on the proportion of diary based paintings, which is exactly equivalent to a DC. Right. So the apprentice hypothesis seems validated. And it suggests, oh, no, before it suggests anything, this is just an illustration. These are three generations of painters in Venice. So all paintings fall from my corpus by those three painters. These are not exactly, this is not a proof, just an illustration. But I think it's a nice one because it includes Titian. Uh, uh, statistically speaking, I love Titian because he lived for so long and produced so many paintings. Uh, he had a 75 years long career. And during that career, Titian is famous for changing everything. The way he used color, the way he used pose, the themes, everything. He went to Rome, he went everywhere to, to learn new techniques. The one thing that Titian does not change is the proportion of Darius in his paintings, which is always more or less 60%, from the first half of his career to the, the last half of his career. Now, Titian was, uh, some said, a student and certainly the contemporary of one very influential painter who is Bellini, and Bellini never ever painted Darius painting in his life. But Titian, of course, increases the rate, uh, the, the amount of Darius paintings in, in his oeuvre uh, by a uh, big, big, big factor. And Tintoretto, who's an exact contemporary of the second Titian, the second life, half of Titian's life, again increases the proportion of Darius in his uh, portraits by a, a big, big, big margin. So here we see that a change that appeared continuous when we looked at it on the graphs, and which was indeed really continuous, is underpinned by a demographic dynamics that is anything but continuous. That is indeed a series of, of leaps, of discrete leaps that are uh, that the pace being given by the passing of generations. So this suggests <coughs> that the portraitist style was fixated during an early critical period. And we have some documents from that time suggesting this is a, a young apprentice in a painter's uh, workshop who's uh, training at painting portraits and is copying uh, designs of eyes. So we have reasons to believe that uh, painters were apprentices very young 
and their taste and their, their style was fixated at an early stage. <coughs> to check if that was the case, I looked at the first decade of 28 painters to try and have an identified people period. So for uh, each one of those dots, he's a painter, uh, and uh, it's, it's plotted against his decade, his first decade, the first decade for which we have a recorded painting, a recorded portrait, sorry, by that painter. And then I plotted uh, the rates of, the, the, the proportion of diary gaze portraits in that painter's first decade against the general diary gaze uh, rate for that decade, the proportion of diary gaze portraits in that decade. So the general average for the population at that decade. And this is a plot of beginning time. And we see that the, the departure rate, uh, the departure from the mean by young painters who just entered the market is significantly above uh, what it would be if painters were not significantly departing from, from the mean. So it's uh, much higher than, than one. And this is very likely to be an underestimate because, of course, we, uh, we always overestimate the age at which the painter enters the market because he painted many, many portraits that we have just lost. Right, to conclude. <coughs> uh, I, I started by saying that cultural transmission has one enemy and one friend, the enemy being demographic turnover and friendly community attraction. Now we can see that community attraction and demographic turnover may work hand in hand. In some cases, community attraction being one of them. So my two points today were that the first direct idea is a cognitive attractor that seems to depend on psychological mechanisms that are not entirely specific to a given culture, and second, that some changes resulting from this attraction are punctuated by demographic turnover. And I thank you for your attention. And I encourage you to go see this uh, lady here in the Kamsdugul Bankian Museum. Thank you.